Good evening, Rowan. It's the 12th of December 2016 and it's about six o'clock. And uh, this is a follow on from my usual Sunday evening video where I always reassure you I haven't been seducing any priests over the weekend. Uh, well, today is Monday and I still haven't been seducing any priests. I probably would be seducing priests, uh, but I know how much it pisses you off that I'm not seducing any priests. So that's why I'm not doing it at the moment. And I'm saving myself for my beloved because... He's so wonderful and we're made for each other. And the moment you're in prison, we're going to be together forever. <laughs> anyway, um, I didn't realise quite how long my video was yesterday. So it's no wonder YouTube wouldn't let me glue it all together on there. Uh, so it was probably better to make it in two sections anyway. And I thought that uh, since she'd had these scumbags moving in next door to me to cause me even more stress and upset than I've been caused already, I thought in response to that, I'm going to make even more videos to draw the world's attention to what a complete and utter scumbag you are. Uh, so luckily, I've already got some material for tomorrow's video. So you've got that to look forward to as well as well as looking out for me turning up to make a citizen's arrest for terrorism <laughs> and to kick you in the balls if you tip me the wink. I'm still polishing my steel toe caps every day. Anyway, so without further ado, here's the rest of yesterday's video. Um, and I've got some more material from this very lecture about at the crib, at the crib fest. Um, and uh, I shall be putting that together tomorrow. Um, so you'll be pleased about that, won't you? <laughs> Hasta la próxima. The video tomorrow. Um, so anyway, you say, and yet unlikely people, it seems, are the people that God is likely to pick up. You emphasise that. Pick up as in pick up a one night stand in a nightclub, I suppose, and use. Well, you're not using me, you fucking pervert. Um, so then you say, because it's as if God wants to say to us in figures like this, don't go confusing my freedom, my power, my divine capacity to change things. Don't go confusing that with what the world calls success. And you emphasise that and influence and power. Don't think that the more success and influence and power you've stopped up in this world, you emphasise that. Um, and I think the reason you've emphasised that is because the name of the Catholic Bishop of Leeds, uh, which is the diocese that I'm living in, the Catholic diocese I live in, um, the name of the bishop, his surname is Stock. Uh, so... Don't think that the more success and influence and power you've stocked up in this world, the more likely you are to be doing God's work. Uh, well, you were Archbishop of Canterbury and you've sold your soul to Satan. So that's true. But don't try and put your bullshit agenda on me, Rowan, uh, because it's you who's stocked up all this success. Um, and you've repeatedly called me a failure and all kinds of other things, haven't you? Uh, so rather like um, the story of Gideon, who you were identifying with in my last video, uh, where I said, well, it was amazing. You were saying I had this bad childhood and I was completely screwed up. And that was why I couldn't be ordained. And in identifying with this figure, Gideon, who described himself as um, the least in his father's house and his clan, uh, the least in the tribe of Manasseh. So I said, oh, well, that's quite amazing, isn't it? So when I'm supposed to be the person screwed up in childhood and completely screwed up for life. Uh, that's the reason why I can't be ordained. Uh, but when it emerges that that isn't actually true, actually I was very happy as a child um, and you're completely screwed up and you had a bad childhood, uh, then all of a sudden that's the kind of person that God chooses. So you're doing exactly the same thing here, aren't you? Um, 
you haven't managed to pin it on me that I'm completely screwed up and mentally disturbed, like you were telling everybody, as well as all my other vices that you made up as well. Uh, so I've demonstrated that you're in fact a pervert and mentally disturbed. So now that's the kind of thing that God wants. Um, so I've said I don't think I'm a failure because I'm doing my best to um, follow Christ and you're actually a failure. I've said this a couple of videos ago. You're actually the failure because you've sold your soul to Satan. <laughs> you've done all these evil things um, and all this kind of thing. So now... <laughs> When I say, well, it's not me, it's the failure, it's you. Uh, well, this isn't what God wants either. <laughs> You're really hilarious. <laughs> so anyway, you then say, because if you do, you'll simply give the message that God likes powerful people. Well, you were a powerful person, weren't you? And you were enjoying it, weren't you? And you were pretending that you were more holy and you've got more insight into God's will and scripture and Christian tradition than anyone else who's ever existed. Uh, so you were the one trying to give the impression that God liked you and he didn't like me and people like me, I suppose, by extension. Uh, so you're just twisting everything round. <laughs> So you say, and actually, you know, God has rather a lot of reservations about powerful people. Uh, well, he doesn't have a lot of reservations about powerful people per se, um, although it is said, I mean, and emphasised uh, by Jesus, for example, that it's much harder for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven um, than for poor people. Um, so you don't want to talk about wealth and poverty, do you? Because you're more wealthy than me. Uh, so you won't say anything about that. You won't be more wealthy than me for long, though, because I'm sewing the pants off you. And don't get excited about that uh, metaphor, uh, because I'd rather you kept your pants on, even when I'm kicking you in the balls. Um, so you then say, all the way through the Bible, that's a theme that seems to keep coming back. God wants to demonstrate, it seems, that what changes things is not force, but love, not compulsion, but faithfulness, loyalty. Um, so, well, I've said that you've put me through all of this to try and force me to give you what you want. One of those things being sex, uh, because you can't take no for an answer. And so I don't really have any explanation of why you've put me through this hell, Rowan, if that's not force. Uh, so it's not force but love. Well, it is force, isn't it, Rowan? Because you don't treat a person you love in this way. You don't love me, Rowan. You don't love anyone except yourself. You're a narcissist. <laughs> not compulsion, but faithfulness, loyalty. Well, there's no relationship between us, Rowan. So don't bother being faithful to me because I'm nothing to do with you. I want you to fuck off and get out of my life. And I won't be sparing you a second thought the moment I don't have to. Uh, so you have been trying to compel me. Um, and you have no love, faithfulness or loyalty. All you care is manipulating the outcome you want. That's the only thing you care about. Um, so you say the word used for God's love in the Old Testament and again and again is a word that really means faithful love or committed love, enduring love. Um, what changes things in the world is that kind of love, that kind of patience, that kind of stickability, as we might say. Um, so this is true, actually. I think hesed is the word that you're talking about in Hebrew. Um, but I think this is another, oh, you're not allowed to leave me in the Church of England stance, isn't it? You, you, you're exhibiting the classic signs of the uh, dog in the manger aren't you because all that time I was in the church of England and all you did was abuse me and make my life hell so I fucked off to the catholic church um, and now you kind of want to ruin all of that as well don't you uh, so you never wanted to treat me in a good way when I was in the church of England um, and now you're acting in this way and complaining that I just didn't want to stay in the church of England and continue to be abused um, so I had quite a lot of stickability, Rowan, and I've gone over this over and over again 
So I'm not explaining myself again, uh, but just get this through your head. I'm staying in the Catholic Church forever. And even in the extremely unlikely event that I decided to leave the Catholic Church, I would certainly not be going back to the Church of England. You shouldn't have put me through all that hell just to try and bring me under your control. All of this and my attitude towards you and my impatience with you and the fact that I won't have anything to do with you, all this has to do with your behaviour, flaws in your character and it, it's not because there's anything wrong with me. And in fact, I've got this patience, stickability um, and this enduring committed love, but that's directed towards God and it's not directed towards you. And you're affronted by that because you think that you are God and you should have everybody's faithful adoration and praise and all that kind of thing. And you just throw a wobbly when you don't get it. Um, and you then say, and that's not at all the same thing as waving magic wands to produce all sorts of major political change. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, you haven't sold your soul to Satan and you're not shaking chicken bones and sacrificing virgins and all this kind of thing. Uh, you're exhibiting patience, stickability and faithful love. Really. <laughs> you must think I was born yesterday. So just at the moment when we're thinking rather a lot about what political change and political power might mean. So you're talking about Brexit and Donald Trump again. Mary suddenly seems to have rather a lot to say to us, I feel. But there we are. The first lesson, it seems, is don't confuse the way God works with the way human beings get their way. And you emphasise get their way. Uh, well, I've talked about you just trying to get your way, haven't I? <laughs> and you're throwing tantrums and throwing your toys out of your pram and that kind of thing. Um, all of this to get your own way. <laughs> but don't worry, Rowan, uh, because I know you're just throwing a tantrum and throwing your toys out of your pram. <laughs> so I won't be giving you what you want. I know exactly what you're doing. So you then say, God is gradually getting through to us through the whole story of the Bible and in a particularly focused way in this story, the truth, you emphasise that, of how he works. If God were to go around beating people over the head to persuade them of his love, something would have gone badly wrong. Uh, so I did actually have a woman knock me down in the street outside her house um, and she came out of the house with a pair of shoes and she battered me around the head for five minutes, about five minutes. And a crowd of people just stood around watching and didn't do anything until eventually two women came and rescued me from her boyfriend who also assaulted me, um, broke my bag strap so I couldn't use my bag anymore and threw my shopping down the street and destroyed it so I had to buy some more. Um, so, and I poured milk in the doorway of the house. I'd got four pints of milk in a big carton. And because this woman had, she'd grabbed my breast before she battered me down in the street and carried on battering me. And I sat on the pavement and nobody came to help me. They just stood there watching a crowd of people. Um, and then I got up and they'd left the door of their house open. The house opened directly onto the street. I didn't go into their garden or anything. And I stood outside and I poured four pints of milk. Well, about three pints of milk over their front doormat uh, because they battered me to the ground. And there's absolutely nothing I can do to stop people abusing me. And nobody helps me to join in with the bastards who are abusing me. Uh, so that's what I did. And then her boyfriend came out shouting, what are you doing? because um, he was so dumb, he couldn't understand why I didn't like being battered to the ground and having my breast grab, and nobody was helping me. Uh, so that's why I did that. And then he kept trying to attack me, so that about the pint of milk that I had left in the carton, 
I threw at him every time he came near me. And that's when he grabbed my bag um, and he snapped the handle off and he grabbed my shopping and threw it down the street. Um, and then he snatched my mobile phone and he wouldn't give it back and he said he was going to phone the police. Um, and I tried to walk off without my phone um, and he wouldn't give me my phone back and he was stopping me from leaving. And then these two women came and rescued me eventually. I don't know where they came from. Um, and they said uh, they'd follow me home and tell him where I lived um, if he phoned the police. So eventually he let me go and I only lived a couple of streets away. Um, and uh, the police did come round to my house a few minutes later. Uh, but I didn't answer the door because all they do is they arrest me and lock me up in prison cells uh, for hours of a time. Um, you know, drag me off buses and out of churches, repeatedly kidnapping me and traumatising me in this way. And I'm supposed to consider all this as helpful. And a bunch of fucking psychiatrists say I'm not upset about this. I'm upset because I'm not a fucking nun. And I don't even want to be a nun. Uh, so this is what I have to put up with. Um, so... All of this is happening because of your evil, filthy abuse and because of the bastards who are engineering it. Um, and the simple fact is that nobody actually gives a fuck about me. Uh, they'd rather kill me uh, than stop all this fucking bullshit. Um, I'm the last person who's considered in all of this shit that's being done to me. Nobody gives a fuck. Nobody gives a fuck. And you certainly don't give a fuck. Uh, so whose idea was it to have that fucking evil whore battering me to the ground in the street then? Who thought of that? So you then go on to say, the story then is about God working on the edges of things in the unexpected places. And for those of us in the church, it's usually quite helpful to remember that the church, church gets changed and renewed from the edges more often than from the middle. Um, so you've talked a lot, actually. You said mission. This is a quotation that many people make from you, actually. Mission is finding out what God's doing in the world and joining in. So I'd like to put this to you, Rowan. I don't actually agree with this, but you said this. So I'd like to put this to you. Uh, is what God is doing in the world, then it's having Britain leave the European Union and having Donald Trump elected Prime Minister of the United States. Is that what God's doing in the world? Um, and if not, why not? Why not? I don't agree with this statement of yours, but that's what you said. Uh, so you find out what God's doing in the world, don't you, Rowan? As long as God, in inverted commas, is doing what you want him to do. Um, so you then say, people who've made a great difference to how people think about Christian faith have so often across the centuries been people rather on the edges of things. St Francis of Assisi, who more or less saved the church in the 13th century. I thought it was in the 12th century. I think you got the wrong century. Maybe I've written it down wrong. But I'm sure he was around in the 12th century because he was canonised in the 13th century, I believe. Uh, so anyway, so I think that was the 12th century. Um, so Francis of Assisi, who more or less saved the church in the 13th century, didn't start out as St Francis of Assisi. He started out as an extremely eccentric ex-playboy, converted in a very implausible way. Um, so, converted in a very implausible way, well, he had a vision. Um, I mean, he, wa he was um, an eccentric ex-playboy, I suppose you could put it that way. Um, but he was in the army, he got taken prisoner, was a prisoner of war for a year and I suppose that made him reflect on things a bit. Um, and uh, anyway, then he had a vision um, and he dedicated himself to Christ and to following this path and founding his order, the Franciscans. Um, so the point is, you see, Rowan, he was an ex-playboy, not a current playboy. And you're trying desperately hard to be a current playboy, aren't you? 
So converted in a very implausible way. Well, he had a vision. Uh, so why is that implausible then, Rowan? Well, I suppose it's implausible if you don't believe that God exists and that God can reveal himself to people in certain ways. You see, um, if God exists and if Christ exists and if the saints are in heaven, uh, then why would it be implausible uh, that saints or God or Christ could appear to people. It isn't implausible. It's only implausible if you don't believe in these things. Uh, so I think you've given yourself away again there, haven't you? So he was an ex-playboy converted in a very implausible way who had stripped himself naked in the marketplace. There's a lot of nakedness features in your rhetoric, isn't there? Um, of Assisi and handed over all his clothes to his father and accepted the bishop's cloak as a temporary solution to his problem. Uh, right, so here's the story around that then. Um, St Francis of Assisi believed he was called by God to um, rebuild the church. Um, so in order to do that, he interpreted that very literally at first and actually started rebuilding derelict churches. Um, so in order to finance this, he sold some cloth that belonged to his father. His father was a cloth merchant. He was a wealthy man. And his father was very annoyed about this. Um, and so this is why St. Francis of Assisi stripped off his fine clothes in the market square to give them back to his father and then he put on the cloak of the Bishop of Assisi. Uh, so he wasn't exposing himself in the market square he was giving back things that belonged to his father because his father was annoyed that he'd sold some cloth uh, that didn't belong to him uh, so that's the story around that and accepted the bishop's cloak as a temporary solution to his problem uh, so well i've got a lot of problems haven't i because of you and you want me uh, to prostitute myself um, to resolve these problems as you see it. You're determined that I'm going to do that. So you want me to be stripping off my clothes, don't you? And accepting your cloak, the bishop's cloak, as a temporary solution to this problem. Uh, well, I've already talked about that. Zip your trousers up and fuck off. Um, and in any case, it wouldn't be a temporary solution. It's a trick. <laughs> so... He accepted the bishop's cloak as a temporary solution to his problem and decided to embark on a life of wandering. Oh, what you mean like gypsies? Begging. You emphasise begging. Insecure witness to the poverty and the love of Christ in everything and everyone. Uh, so, yes, he did do that. So you emphasise begging. Are you begging then, or do you want me to be begging? Um, and you're emphasising poverty again, aren't you? The way that you keep talking about a string of noughts and bankruptcy and all this kind of thing uh, to try and convince me that I should prostitute myself um, to feed your narcissistic delusions and to save your skin. Zip your trousers up and fuck off. Um, so you then say, I've nearly finished now, I've only got another page left to go. And from the edge, from that strange place that he occupied, a man who would have been written off by many as completely round the bend from that perspective, that place on the edge, somehow the wheel is turned and the church changes. Um, so you're someone who is completely round the bend, uh, but Francis of Assisi wasn't a psychopath and uh, he turned from his playboy existence and he turned... Uh, back to Christ, was reconciled with the church um, and he embarked on this vocation and founded the Franciscan Order and did many other things and wrote things as well. Um, so this is what he did, um, but you're not doing any of that, are you? As I've said, the problem with you is not that you're an ex-playboy, it's that you're still trying to be a playboy and you're not even trying to be a playboy with other people who want to be involved with you. You're trying to drag me down into this cesspit of filth and corruption along with you. Um, and so you then say, and there are many other instances, and it's always worth remembering that the people we may think 
are central to the church's project. The people who sometimes think they are central to the church's project are perhaps the least likely to be the ones where grace is turning the wheel and changing the church. While bishops and archbishops and even incumbents and PCCs go about their business, doubtless with exemplary piety and devotion and consistency. Um, so let me just talk about this. Right, an incumbent is somebody who is in charge of a, a parish um, in the Church of England. Um, and a PCC is the parochial church council, uh, the church council, council of a parish in the Church of England. Uh, so I would just like to point out to you, Rowan, that if it weren't for you, um, I would have been an incumbent and possibly even a bishop in the Church of England now that there are women bishops in the Church of England. And also that I was on the parochial church council uh, for many years um, in three separate pas parishes that I was involved with, um, one in Wales and two in England. Um, so I was doing all of these things. I mean, I would have been doing these other things, being an incumbent as an ordained person, had it not been for all the lies that you were telling about me. So I would have been doing those things. I was on the PCC and you had me thrown out of that parish in Headingley and then you wouldn't allow me to be involved in any other parish in any way like this. Um, so I was doing this, going about my business with piety and devotion and consistency um, and the only reason that I wasn't doing that any longer and doing it in the way that I wanted to do it was because of you and so you're saying here that somewhere there's someone completely unlikely a completely unlikely person getting on with saying their prayers and loving their neighbours who is actually making the long-term difference uh, well this is a very condescending attitude isn't it uh, so it's true that God may be working through someone else, but uh, there's no reason why he wouldn't also be working through the bishops and incumbents and PCCs. Um, God doesn't randomly choose people. <laughs> he sees the heart of the person and that's the person um, that's the thing that's important rather, the heart of the person. Um, it's not whether someone is or isn't a bishop, whether they're in the centre or on the margins. And I would point out actually that um, quite a lot of um, saints in the Catholic Church were religious and were priests. Uh, so they were kind of at the centre of things, I suppose you could say. Um, and it doesn't stop a person having this devotion and uh, really um, I think people in the church have a right uh, to think that the clergy are at least doing their best to develop this virtue and consistency and devotion. Of course th there's never that attitude in the Church of England I found. Uh, it was all about the clergy expressing themselves and having to express themselves and not really thinking that looking after the congregation um, was an important thing at all or it wasn't the most important thing to them. Uh, I don't think they really understood vocation. That was my experience, my opinion about it. Uh, so it's your state of life is insignificant. It's true God chooses people at the margins, but he also chooses people at the centre as well. And if people are paying for the upkeep of clergy, particularly, then they've got the right to expect them to prioritise these things, even if they haven't got there yet. Um, and of course, you don't do anything of the sort. Um, so somewhere there's some completely unlikely person. Uh, well, not completely unlikely. <laughs> Is it really Rowan? I mean, we've got the book, haven't we, as to how to um, assess whether someone's exhibiting virtue in a Christian sense or not. It's not as if it's completely arbitrary, although you'd like it to be so. Uh, so, who is actually making the long-term difference? And the maddening thing is that we so seldom know who they are. <laughs> You know perfectly well who they are, Rowan. That's why you go around trying to destroy them. Uh, so just occasionally a Francis of Assisi comes to the surface and we sort of get the point that God is likely to work 
in unlikely places. Um, so I've talked about that before, but you keep going over the same thing. Um, and it's not entirely unpredictable who these people will be. Uh, because as I've said on many videos before, Jesus said that we would know people by their fruits. Um, and actually the person's character originates in the heart. This is where uncleanness comes from. It's also where virtue comes from. Uh, so it's not entirely unpredictable. There are signs that we can look for. Anyway, I've been talking for a phenomenally long time now without a break. Um, so this video is already too long, really. Um, and I haven't even finished yet. I've got another clip to talk about. So I might do that tomorrow. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, don't forget to be alert. Um, because I shall be turning up to make a citizen's arrest. Um, and obviously I'll be kicking you in the balls as well if you tip me the wink. But I won't be taking any clothes off and asking for your cloak, so don't get excited. And also, when I said I was going to sew the pants off you, uh, well, you'll get a pair of pants provided um, in the prison, won't you? Um, so you can be wearing those while you're looking at my picture outside your college in Cambridge with my arms around my beloved and we'll be gazing adoringly at each other waving the Union flag and the Welsh flag with the European Union flag burning in the background oh and I thought we could probably have like uh, the Magdalen College choir singing the Magnificat or uh, followed by Royal Britannia um, and uh, you can see all of that can't you on the picture um, next to your double life-size portrait of Donald Trump um, standing on the White House steps. Uh, so I shall be wanting to sleep all night and dream about my beloved. Um, but if these bastards make any more noise, I shall be battering their door down with my fucking rolling pin, especially because I'm in a phenomenally bad mood because I burnt my fucking cake, uh, because I didn't hear the timer, because I had to put music in headphones to drown the sound of all their shit out. Uh, so this is how helpful this bollocks is. They just make everything ten times worse. Um, so I'll bid you farewell now, uh, but don't forget to be alert. Um... <laughs> Hasta la próxima. And yet, unlikely people it seems, are the people that God is likely to pick up and use. Because it's as if God wants to say to us in figures like this, don't go confusing my freedom, my power, my divine capacity to change things. Don't go confusing that with what the world calls success and influence and power. Don't think that the more success and influence and power you stocked up in this world, the more likely you are to be doing God's work. Don't muddle up God and the world in that way. Because if you do, you'll simply give the message that God likes powerful people. And actually, you know, God has rather a lot of reservations about powerful people. <laughs> All the way through the Bible, that's a theme that seems to keep coming back. God wants to demonstrate, it seems, that what changes things is not force, but love, not compulsion, but faithfulness, loyalty. The word used for God's love in the Old Testament, again and again, is a word that really means faithful love or committed love, enduring love. What changes things in the world is that kind of love, that kind of patience, that kind of stickability as we might say. And that's not at all the same thing as waving magic wands to produce all sorts of major political change. Just at the moment when we're thinking rather a lot about what political change and political power might mean, Mary suddenly seems to have rather a lot to say to us, I feel. But there we are. The first lesson, it seems, is don't confuse the way God works with the way human beings get their way. God is gradually getting through to us through the whole story of the Bible, and in a particularly focused way here in this story, the truth of how he works. If 
God were to go around beating people over the head to persuade them of his love, something would have gone wrong, badly wrong. The story then is about God working on the edges of things, in the unexpected places. And for those of us in the church, it's usually quite helpful to remember that the church gets changed and renewed from the edges more often than from the middle. People who've made a great difference to how people think about Christian faith have so often across the centuries been people rather on the edges of things. St. Francis of Assisi, who more or less saved the church in the 13th century, didn't start out as St. Francis of Assisi. He started out as an extremely eccentric ex-playboy, converted in a very implausible way, who had stripped himself naked in the marketplace of Assisi and handed over his clothes to his father and accepted the bishop's cloak as a temporary um, solution to his problem and decided to embark on a life of wandering, begging, insecure witness to the poverty and the love of Christ in everything and everyone. And from the edge, from that strange place that he occupied, a man who would have been written off by many as completely around the bend, from that pers perspective, that place on the edge, somehow the wheel is turned and the church changes. And there are many other instances, and it's always worth remembering that the people we may think are central to the church's project, the people sometimes who think they are central to the church's project, are perhaps the least likely to be the ones where grace is turning the wheel and changing the church. While bishops and archbishops and even incumbents and PCCs go about their business, doubtless with exemplary piety and devotion and consistency. Somewhere, there's some completely unlikely person getting on with saying their prayers and loving their neighbours who is actually making the long-term difference. And the maddening thing is that we so seldom know who they are. Just occasionally, a Francis of Assisi comes to the surface and we sort of get the point that God is likely to work in unlikely places. You want a piece of me? It's the most likely to get on the TV for slipping on the streets when getting the groceries. Now for real, are you kidding me? No wonder there's panic in the industry. I mean, please. Catholics have the best sex. <laughs>